Well, good morning. So glad that you're here with us. Bob Ross and Kelly and I are so glad you've joined us here at our home for praise and worship this morning for our worship service. Merry Christmas. It is our Christmas service. You know, Christmas is just a few days away, relatively few days away, and we're just so happy to spend this time together with you to worship, to uh, just, just to be, even virtually, to be with you here. And we'd love for you to join us on, hop in on the chat and say hi. We'd love to know who's joining us today. Um, I know you're at home and so it's, it's harder to engage, but if you just try to set aside all the distractions and put your focus on the Lord, we invite you to join with us in this time of worship. Amen. We don't need a metronome. Just imagine 
Lord, we lift you up. We lift your name, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. You are Almighty God. Oh, there is no one like you. Oh, come, all ye faith, joyful and triumphant. Praise God. It is so good to worship. You know, even though we're not in person and we're at home, we can still worship God. Every Sunday, we should honor Him in praise and worship, being in His Word, in prayer. These are the things that we should do as lovers of God. You know, we got a couple of announcements I want to, you know, get to and, and make sure we can get those in. But before that, 
Pastor Kelly and Keegan has uh, prepared a skit for us. So I want us to check that out right now. Oh, wow. My wings do look bigger. Oh. Oh, hi there. Hi. Is the big guy in? Um, God Almighty is always in, but, uh, do you have an appointment? Um, I was sent for, uh, that is, Gabriel's on vacation and I'm his assistant. Oh, well, uh, this is a very important assignment. Um, do you have any experience? Actually, um, have you ever been down there before? Down there? Oh, sure. I got to watch when Gabriel told young Mary that she was to be the Lord's mother. What a special moment. She cried, and I cried. Beautiful. Oh, well, I suppose it's all right then. Great. Where do I get to go? I'd love to be in somebody's dream. And am, I, am I to visit King Herod? No. <sighs> oh, maybe I should start polishing my trumpet right away. No, wait, just a minute. Come back here. Um, you're actually to go out and um, visit the shepherds in the fields near Bethlehem. All right. The shepherds? Are you sure about that? Ours is not to question God Almighty. He has a perfect plan for everything. With the shepherds, they smell bad, and they're a little loony. No one from down there even listens to them. Um, well, God needs an angel to go share the good news about baby Jesus to the shepherds. So, um, do you want the job or not? Uh, I suppose I could get someone else. That won't be necessary. I want the job. Okay. What's the message? Um, let's see. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. You mean the just ones of Israel, right? No, it says right here, for all people. Well, this might not be so bad after all. It continues. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. I think I'm going to cry. <sighs> just get going. But wait, uh, remember to appear gently. Uh, the shepherds are humble folk, and, well, the Lord doesn't want them to freak out. <laughs> Don't you worry, this message is in good hands. I hope so. You know who will be watching from up here. Okay, let's see how it's going down on Earth. Ooh, uh, yeah. Oh, you were just about to buzz me? Uh, yes sir, the shepherds do look sore afraid. Mm. But the message is going better now, don't you think? Oh, um. Yes, sir, I can send forth reinforcements. How about a heavenly host? They can praise you and glorify your name. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Oh, I'm going to get demoted this time for sure. Man, that was so good. Thank you so much, Pastor Kelly and Keegan, for that. That is excellent. So just... I'm going to go ahead and get these announcements so we can get right into the Word because I'm excited about the Word and I believe it's going to help you in your life. So um, Midweek Word, if you didn't tune in last week, Wednesday night, you missed a treat. Tierra Thompson has written a story and she is reading that story for our Midweek Word. So um, you'll see it on the YouTube channel just in the same way you're listening now. Um, so go and make sure you check that out because that's part one and this Wednesday is part two and she will be finishing that story so you don't want to miss it again. So the midweek word, be sure and do that. Also, if you have any prayer requests, be sure to send them to prayer at churchpluggedin.com. Also, offering. You know, if you, these, these are our ways to give. And church, I want to thank you for your giving. We have such a generous church that supports us and allows us to do what we're doing right now with our lights and camera and all the stuff. And so I really appreciate your giving to the church. And these are the different ways to give. You can give online. You can text an amount to 703-997-4640. Or you can mail this in here. You can also go and look at these ways to give. And just click on the Give tab on churchpluggedin.com. So again, church, I want to thank you for your generous giving. And may God bless you for it. So this morning, 
I want to talk about a forgotten follower of Christ named Joseph. You know, there's a lot of people who simply lack the resolve to genuinely follow Christ. They'd like to, but to really go all in requires a motivation beyond what they have. I think I've been surrounded by those kind of people all my life. They follow Jesus when it's easy, when they are part of a group of friends who are all doing it. And so, oh, I'll just naturally fit in, you know, with that lifestyle. But they lack the, lack the strength to do it when it's hard, to really follow Jesus when things in life get hard. You know, to swim upstream is not easy, but sometimes that's what we've got to do. To keep going when there is nobody standing behind them going, oh, come on, come on, come on. You know, hey, when you don't have a cheerleader, are you still following Christ? You know, so many just putter out and they fall behind because they don't have that somebody cheerleading for them. To, and what I'm saying is, is to actually follow Jesus can be difficult at times. Following Jesus ushers you into a life that is the most joyful life, but yet tribulations are here on earth, and that follows you. It, 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 Jesus said tribulations are going to come, but now I have a Savior and a Lord to help me through those tribulations when I follow him. John 10.10 10 tells us that Jesus gives us life and life more abundantly. We've read that scripture many times in the past. Psalm 1611 says that in God's presence is the fullness of joy. Psalms 8410 tells us better is one day in God's presence than 10,000 elsewhere. Mm. But then Matthew 16 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So a sacrifice is made to follow Christ. We sacrifice our old life for a new one. And, and you know, as Christians, those that are listening, you've been saved for a while, you know this. And yes, the cross is an awesome symbol for the Christian. So much so that we wear crosses, we put diamonds on them, we do it as jewelry, we make shirts and we have crosses on the shirts and all that stuff. But in ancient times, a cross was not a pleasant image. It wasn't something anybody back then wanted to think about. Back then, it was a symbol of oppression, torture, and death that caused horror in the eyes of, of, of people who saw the, any, any cross because they knew what it was for. But for Christians today, the symbol of the cross should mean dying to oneself and following Christ. As this scripture says, we die to ourselves. That's what it means to take up a cross. My life, no. Nah, it, I have to pick up a new life and follow Christ because I have to remember what Jesus did and embrace that new life that he gave through his death for us. For Paul, following Jesus meant suffering, sacrifice, and persecution. He gladly sacrificed because it gave him fullness of life, which was living in who he was in Christ. His, uh, the scripture says that we are righteous. We are made the righteousness of God. So he walked in that. And so to go all the way with Jesus, you have to have a strong grasp on why he's worth it. And he is worth it because he's Lord of all and King of all. And when we serve him, he blesses us beyond measure. And we don't do it just because of that. We do it because we love him. And you have to understand the power of the resurrection and what it means for you to follow Christ, to truly follow him. Jesus means sacrifice. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I thank you for this word. I thank you that, you know, this short word would just go into each person's heart, Father God. Lord, that you would do a work in every person that is hearing this message here this morning. Lord, just as it, 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 it's affected me and it got me thinking on some things, Father, I thank you that you would just do the same in others and that all distractions would be gone and we would all listen to the end. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Sacrifice is what you see in Matthew chapters 1 through 2. Matthew shows you right out of the gate 
how difficult it is to follow Jesus and how Jesus' first followers found the motivation to go. By the way, if I asked you what were, you know, to, to name a few of Jesus' first followers, you know, uh, you saw the title of the message about Joseph, but if you didn't have that in your head, you'd, you'd be saying Peter, John, Philip, you know, one of the other 12 disciples. But Matthew starts much earlier than that. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Okay. First, let's talk about betrothal. Betrothal was a a Jewish custom of the day. A young man and his fiancée would legally get married. But they had to wait a period of time, that was the betrothal, and it was usually a year before they were allowed to live together or sleep together, which has to be one of the dumbest inventions or traditions ever invented. Uh, That tradition, I don't understand it. But in ancient days, marriage was not an agreement between two individuals, but between two families. The father... Uh, a father, you know, would choose, uh, would the would choose to to, as a father, when you choose a wife for your son, because you're 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 doing that with another family. What you would do is, you would pay a huge price to the bride's family. The parents paying the price wanted to make sure that the girl was was pure and all of that, and 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 so that's why they required this waiting period before you could live or sleep together. And so she would go back and live with her family after, you know, the, the, the ceremony. After the betrothal period was over, you could then live together and have relations and consummate the marriage. But in every other way during the betrothal, you were still considered married. Married, You belonged with that other person, even though you weren't living together. Like I said, it's one of the dumbest traditions <laughs> ever. So, well, during this betrothal period, Mary shows up pregnant. Now, can you imagine for a minute how painful and humiliating this was for Joseph? What would it have been like for him, for the girl you just married to come and say, I'm pregnant and you haven't slept with her? What are you thinking in your mind? How is that going to affect you? You know, Joseph doesn't believe what she says to her. Like, oh yeah, right, the Holy Ghost got you pregnant. And I guess he got you a pet unicorn too, right? You know, you don't believe anything she's saying. But Joseph was still, he was a good guy. He was kind. So he arranged to break the betrothal quietly. And if you look there, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. Joseph was a just man. You know, he didn't want to make her a public example. He didn't want to embarrass her. He wanted to try to, you know, break these things off quietly You know, legally, though, he could have raised Cain. He could have had her stoned. But then we read in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus." For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took him his wife. And did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, did you ever wonder why God did things this way and did it like this? It ruined both of their reputations, Joseph and Mary. The angel didn't show up and explain the situation to everybody. The angel only appeared to Mary and Joseph. He didn't send out a news bulletin. There was no internet to break the news on Facebook of what was happening. Oh, the Messiah is coming. None of that. 
So everyone else from that point on thought of Mary as an impure girl. Like, I didn't know she had a dark side like that. As far as we know, there was never any clarification until the New Testament was written 30 to 40 years later, which by that point was kind of irrelevant. And when Joseph married her, it seemed like he was confessing that the baby was actually his. The pregnancy ruined both of their reputations in the community. This had to be hard for Joseph and Mary. Mary didn't get that wedding celebration after the betrothal period that she always wanted. Ruined not by an angry mother-in-law, but by Jesus himself. Not only that, eventually they'd have to flee their homeland because of Jesus. This all sounds extremely rough. And when you think about the story, you know, is this abundant life that Jesus promises? Why did, why did God do it this way? And I think the Holy Spirit is laying out the pattern from Jesus' birth for how people will have to follow him. And when we do it, it still gives us fullness of life. We have more joy with our Savior in our life than we would without. I want to give you a few elements from Joseph's life about following Jesus. Joseph is not just an inspiring person from the past. He's a compelling example for the present. He is a follower of Christ. Therefore, we should look at what he did and follow his example. So what following Jesus looks like? Three things here we get from Joseph. Joseph, Number one, trust and absolute obedience. Just look at that and just soak that in for a minute. Because Joseph had to believe the impossible and risk everything on it. Yeah, an angel showed up, but he had to still risk everything. You don't do that because Jesus is your preference You do that because he rose from the dead, because his word says that his promises are true. His kingdom is eternal. You know, that's how we're supposed to do when it comes to the word and and what Jesus said. We're to trust and obey him 100%. Therefore, you sacrificially give of your time, talent, and treasure. You know, one minister I read online this week, he said this, If you struggle being sacrificial, it's because you lack confidence in the promises of the unseen God. Wow. See, people who lack confidence in God's promises, they'll throw some, you know, guilt money in the plate from time to time, but they'll never give in a sustained, sacrificial way, either in the church or outside the church to others. Church, we, we have got to give of our time, talent, and treasure. You know, something else, we're commanded to, in Scripture, to forgive others. That's sacrificial. Let me tell you. And you have to trust in what God it says in his word and believe what he says in his word about forgiveness. You know, there, there are people who've been through some awful situations, like maybe, you know, uh, uh, a young girl who was sexually abused by her father. That would be extremely hard to, to forgive him, and it would take time. But it would take bold confidence in God's forgiveness and his ability to work all things for good. And that doesn't mean you go and have a relationship with him still. What it means is that you release it out of your life and allow it to not affect you in a negative way anymore. That's trusting and having absolute obedience in God's word concerning forgiveness because we are to forgive as God forgives us. Even with the, you know, the situations may be extremely hard. Because, you know, without that confidence in God's forgiveness, you'll never have the strength to to forgive. You won't be able to do it. I know I'm talking to somebody right now on this point. You know, trust and absolute obedience. Do you totally trust and have absolute confidence in God and obeying his word? Mm. You know, church, look, the world's not going to give you the resources. Oprah's not going to come and give you the resources to forgive a father who abused you. It's just not going to happen. You, it only comes from seeing God's forgiveness in his word and that it's bigger than yours and greater than other people's ability to inflict evil upon you. It's greater. His forgiveness is greater than what anybody else can do. 
to harm you or hurt you. It's greater than all the situations you're going through. Following Jesus, really following him, not just playing a religious game, means absolute trust in the unseen God. Do you trust him? Number two, self-denial. Self-denial. This is also a sacrifice. Verse 25 tells us that Joseph didn't know Mary. Uh, you know, it says he, he did not know her. In other words, he did not have sexual relationship with her until he brought forth her firstborn son. Think about that. He went through a long betrothal period, and then he waited for the pregnancy to end. I mean, this man's waiting almost two years. That's a long time. It, not only did he have to wait that betrothal period, he had to wait again for Jesus to be born in some time after that. That's significant. I, I, I really do. I think that's very significant. Following Jesus means dying to yourself to some of the things you might otherwise enjoy. You know, we have singles out there that aren't willing to wait to have sex, and they're not even married. Look, I'm not saying that to be condemning. I'm saying, do you have trust and absolute obedience in God, and are you denying yourself, putting yourself aside, and following God's way? When you do it God's way, you're blessed immeasurably. It's so much better. It's so much greater. Joseph was married and had to wait to have sex because it was the will of God. If you're going to follow Jesus, you have to consent to do things the way he says, which means you've got to deny yourself some things that you might otherwise have. You deny yourself some things that other people do because they don't have the wisdom. God has the wisdom, and he wants to give that to you. So as you deny yourself, I'm telling you, church, I did that in this area right here, just like Joseph did. He didn't know Mary. I didn't know my wife, Carrie Ann. Until I was married in that wedding night, and it was special. Amen. Amen. I praise God that I did it God's way in this area. Look, I'm not perfect. I've messed up in other areas and different things. I just praise God I got it, you know, right on that one. Amen. We got couples listening to me right now. You're not married, but you're living together. If you're going to have Jesus reign supreme in your family, you need to do things God's way, the biblical way, if you want Jesus to reign supreme. Number three, a willingness to embrace inconvenience. A willingness to embrace inconvenience. Do you realize how much Jesus' birth complicated Joseph's life? Messed up his relationships with his family, his friends, his job. Eventually, he had to move and start over. Church, serving Jesus is rarely convenient. I praise God that we have a serving church. So many of you give of your time and serve in the church, and, and you don't do it because it's convenient. You do it because you're willing to embrace inconvenience for the cause of Christ, because you love God, because you're committed to Jesus and his word. Yes, it's true that serving the church is inconvenient, and serving outside the church is just as inconvenient if not more, you know, helping at a battered women's shelter or volunteering at the, you know, the, the food pantry or, or, or helping your neighbors with stuff even. Sharing Christ with them. It's not convenient. The word says to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that starts with your neighbors, your, your extended family, neighbors, those that you know, telling them about Christ. That's not always convenient. You know, you have to embrace inconvenience as Joseph did. Now, you might be thinking, those three points don't sound like fun. They don't sound realistic. Are you not sure? Oh, oh, TJ, I'm not sure I could do that. So where did Joseph get the strength to trust and obey God, to deny himself and be willing to embrace inconvenience? Look back with me one more time in the Scripture. Matthew 1, verse 21, and we're going to look at verse 23. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. First of all, I want you to see this word behold. Behold in the Greek is idu, and it's an extremely strong word. It's like saying, look at this, and you say it like that. Have you ever tried to get somebody to say, look at this? No, right now, look at this. That's what behold is. Because when you see this, you'll have the strength to do what God is asking you to do. So what is he telling Joseph to look at? This baby is giving two names in these verses, Jesus and Emmanuel. The first name, Jesus, indicates what he does. The second, Emmanuel, who he is. Jesus means in Hebrew, God saves, or Jehovah is salvation. Emmanuel means God with us. In those two names, Joseph got a picture of the glory of God. He could easily, or more easily, share in the sufferings of Christ because he knew that God would be with them. God be with us. And Jesus is going to save everybody. This is important. I've got to do this. No matter how uncomfortable it is, no matter how inconvenient it is. And when you have your eyes on Jesus as he is the Savior and he is with you, he's with you through all the things you're going through, he's with you and he sees everything you do, it helps you to realize that he's right there. You can have the strength to overcome the enemy, the temptations to do things that the enemy's telling you to do or the world's telling you to do. You can put that down under your feet and you can self-sacrifice, self-denial. You can trust and obey God. You can be willing to embrace inconvenience like never before. Church is God with you. You know, Christmas is coming up, and I think we need to remember that God is Emmanuel. Jesus is Emmanuel. Through all the hard things that we're going through, let's remember that God is truly with us. Let's trust, obey him, deny ourselves, and embrace inconvenience. Church, I hope this message about Joseph and his example has touched you. He's the forgotten follower of Christ. Most of the time, the focus is on Mary, and she went through a lot too, and rightfully so. She was the one who birthed the Savior. And it's probably not how she thought. But when you go back in Scripture, and I'll give you a little homework, I want you to go and look and see what Mary said about Jesus and the birth of the Savior. And her acceptance of what God was doing, and she counted it an honor. You could really tell. But so many, we look at Peter, John, you know, throughout the year, you know, we, we don't really talk about the Christmas story. And when and a lot of times when we do with the Christmas story, Joseph is kind of an afterthought. But what he did paved the way for the Savior to be born. And he sacrificed all to do it. What are you willing to sacrifice to follow Jesus fully, all the way, to be all in following Jesus. This year at Christmas, I believe if Jesus were here right now and you were to ask him, what do you want for Christmas? He would say, I just want you. I just want you. Be all in with me. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we humble ourselves before you. And Lord, we say forgive us when we've not been all in for you. Where we've not followed you fully. Lord, I pray here today that you would truly be our Lord and Savior. That we would walk in the gift of righteousness that you've given to us through your sacrifice of coming, being born as a man and God here on earth and dying on the cross and rising again. Lord, we give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Don't turn me off. Remember next week, we'll be online here. We won't be at Garfield as well. And then also remember the midweek word. This Wednesday night at 7 p.m. You don't want to miss part two of Boldly Go. And if you have any prayer requests, be sure and send them to prayer at churchpluggedin.com. We love you. God bless. Merry Christmas.